Hi there, Mr. Sutton here bringing you the AB Calculus 413 homework solutions on motion extra practice. For number 8, we've got two runners, A and B, running on a straight racetrack from 0 to 10 seconds. We have a graph above representing the velocity of runner A, and we have this function down here representing the velocity of runner B. For part A, we just want the velocity of runner A and runner B at time 2 seconds with units of measure which we know in both cases is just going to be meters per second. All right, so let's tackle runner A first. Um, so for runner A, we just have to figure out the value of V on this graph or whatever the variable is that we're using when we plug in 2. Um, now here's 2, and it, it's kind of hard to read what that's going to be. It, it looks like it's going to be close to 6, but it might be a little bit off from that. So to be on the safe side, we need to come up with an equation for the velocity of run array and then plug 2 into that equation to be absolutely sure. Um, so because this is a piecewise linear function, we know that this is a line here. We can write its equation if we figure out its slope. For the y-intercept, it's just going through 0, um, so we just have to write whatever the slope is with a t after it, and that's our equation. Now we're going up 10 and over 3, so we have a slope of 10 thirds we can very quickly see here. Um, so we can write 10 thirds t for the equation of that velocity for runner a. We have to be careful when defining this function, though. Um, so from 0 to 3, I'm going to call this v sub a to show that it, this is the velocity of runner a at time t. And we said that's going to be the slope of 10 thirds times t. Now, why don't I just call this v? Well, if you look over here, they already used up v for runner b. Um, so you either have to redefine this or make your own new velocity function. Now that we've got this, though, let's just plug in 2 for t to get runner a's velocity. So that's 10 thirds times 2, which is just 20 thirds. You actually don't have to do anything other than putting meters per second here. Um, but I went ahead and took that extra step. All right. How about runner b? So for runner b, all you actually have to do is plug in 2 to this function here stick in meters per second after it and call it a day. Um, but I chose to do this on the calculator. I chose to enter this in the calculator under y1. And, and the reason for that is looking ahead, I know I'm going to have to use this function later on the calculator anyway. Um, so I'm just going to kind of rip off the Band-Aid now. So here we go. I'm in my y equals. On y1, I've entered 24x over 2x plus 3. I have to use x instead of t on here. And then quitting out of there, I'm going to do alpha trace just to pull up my my menu of functions y1 is where I stored that I'm gonna plug 2 in there press enter and I just have to take it out to three decimals so I've got 6.857 approximately and that's gonna be meters per second for part B they want the acceleration of both runners at time 2 so acceleration for runner a we know that uh, velocity again of runner a was just 10 thirds t at least from 0 to 3 seconds and that's all we care about because we're asking about time 2 so the derivative of that will give us the acceleration and the derivative of this is just 10 thirds so that's 10 thirds meters per second squared for runner a for runner b I'm gonna do this on the calculator um, before I do that though I need to explicitly write out that acceleration of t equals v prime of t. I have to let them know that I know what acceleration means in terms of this velocity function. Um, but once I've defined acceleration thusly, I can just plug 2 in to the derivative of v on my calculator. Uh, so let me show you that. So here's my calculator. I've got y1 already. That's where I put my v in. Um, so I'm just going to do math 8 and call up my a derivative function here. I've got an x down here for my function. I'm going to do alpha trace to get my y1 in there. And for x equals, I wanted the time to be 2, so we'll put 2 in there. Enter. So that comes out to about 1.469 meters per second squared. For number 2, we've got a particle moving along the x-axis whose position ooh, is not explicitly given. But they did give us the velocity of the particle with this function here. And they gave us the acceleration of the particle over here, which is actually just the derivative which they took for you. I guess they didn't want you to spend all that time calculating it yourself. 
and they also tell us x of zero is two. Based on all this, is the speed of the particle increasing or decreasing at time t, 5.5, give a reason. So this is one of those problems where they're just testing if you understand what speed increasing or decreasing means. Um, so as a general principle, if the velocity and the acceleration of a particle have the same sign, then that means that they're working together and we're speeding up. If they have a different sign, opposite signs, that means they're working against each other and we're slowing down. So in order to answer this question, we need to figure out the velocity and the acceleration of this particle at 5.5, which means we need to plug 5.5 in. This is a calculator question, so I recommend you put both of these in Y1, this one for Y1 and this one for Y2, and just plug it in on your calculator. I'm going to do that now. So I'll enter my velocity function under Y1, and I could um, do acceleration. I could actually enter explicitly what they have for the acceleration here in Y2, or I could do derivative of Y1 and put that in Y2. I'm going to use their function, though. It takes a little bit longer to enter in, but if we ever have to graph this thing, it's going to graph a lot faster if I've entered the function directly rather than using the derivative function on the calculator. So here's my acceleration function I'm putting in Y2. And notice for both of these, I'm using X instead of T. So there's the rest of it. And now let's plug some things in. So we want to plug in 5.5. I'm going to quit out to the main screen. And let's see, we'll do alpha trace. And I'll bring up Y1. That'll, and let's see, 5.5 is what I want to plug in. Comes out to this number here. We'll take their word for it. And let's do the same thing now, but alpha trace for Y2. Let's plug 5.5 into that. And we get this other number. Um, so let me just write those out now. So I had negative 0.453 for velocity and negative 1.359 for acceleration. Because these both have the same sign, that means that we're speeding up. Um, so to write this officially, since A and V have the same sign, the particle is speeding up at T equals 5.5. That's also important to put in there. If you just say speeding up without specifying the time, they might not give you credit for it. For number three, we've got a car traveling on a straight road. And uh, for part A, all we really need to know is that the acceleration of that car between 0 and 18 seconds is in the graph. So we want to know, based off of this, if the velocity of the car is increasing at t equals 2 seconds. The key to this one is understanding that acceleration, which we've graphed here, is the rate of change of velocity. If that's the case, that means that wherever acceleration is positive, the velocity must be going up, increasing. So we just have to see if acceleration is positive or negative at t equals 2. Looking at our graph, acceleration definitely positive. Since a of 2 is greater than zero, this is our justification now, that means the velocity must be increasing. Um, so you need to put in both things here. You need to show that you understand acceleration is velocity's rate of change, and you need to show that when you plug two into that function, you get a positive giving you this conclusion. For number four, we have a car traveling on a straight road, and from zero to 24 seconds, our velocity in meters per second, which is important because they're going to want units later, is modeled by this linear piecewise function. Now, piecewise linear, which they spelled out here, means we know for certain that each of these pieces is a line, which will also be important in the question we're doing. So we want to find v prime of 4 and v prime of 20, or explain why it doesn't exist. Starting with v prime 4, since we already have the graph of v, v prime is talking about the slope of that graph, and at 4, at t equals 4, well, we don't know the slope because this is a corner. It's a non-differentiable spot. Um, so v prime of 4 doesn't exist because there is a corner at that value. Okay, how about v prime of 20? So 20 is up here. This is this spot right here we want to find the slope of. Um, since this is in the middle of one of those linear pieces, if we find the slope of this line, and we have two points, so we can find the slope, um, that will tell us what v prime of 20 is. So using our slope formula, we're going to do y2 minus y1. So that's going to be 0 minus 20 for the y values. And then for the x values, we've got 24 minus 16. 
So that's negative 20 over 8. Now, you actually could have stopped right at this point and put on units of measure and been done. Um, but just to simplify it for the sake of simplifying, we've got negative 2.5. And then units of measure, if we want to know the rate at which velocity is changing, that's acceleration. That will be meters per second per second or meters per second squared. For part C of number 4, let A of T be the car's acceleration. Uh, for 0 to 24, write a piecewise linear, a piecewise defined function for A of T. Um, so we're essentially trying to write a function for the slope of this, this graph up here. So to do this, we just have to calculate, since these are lines, we just need to figure out the slope of each line. And we also have to find the intervals. How about the border values? We have border values of 4, 16, and 24. And at these border values, since we have abrupt slope changes, um, we're not going to include the border values at all. So all of our intervals that we're doing in our piecewise function are just going to be less than. There's going to be no less than or equals. So those slopes then, for our first one from 0 to 4, we have a slope of, let's see, we're going up 20 over 4, so that's a slope of 5. Next interval, we've got a slope of 0 going from 4 to 16. And finally, we had a slope of negative 2.5 that we just calculated going from 16 to 24. So 5 from 0 to 4, 0 from 4 to 16, and negative 2.5 from 16 to 24. For part D of this one, we want to find the average rate of change of V over the interval 8 to 20. Um, and there's some other stuff here, but let's do this piece first. So that means we're going to be doing V of 20 minus V of 8 over 20 minus 8. And we have a graph that tells us V values. Uh, so V of 20 right here, this looks to be 10. I mean, you could calculate it precisely, um, but it is 10. We have a slope of negative 2.5. So if I take four steps to the right, that means I'm taking 10 steps down. So we are at 10. And then V of 8 over here, that was on that horizontal line, that was 20. So we've got 10 minus 20 over 12. And you could just leave it like this and put units of measure. Um, if you really want to simplify it down, you've got negative 10 over 12 or negative 5 over 6. Meters per second squared, that part has to go on there. Next part of the question, does the mean value theorem guarantee a value of C between 8 and 20 such that V prime of C equals this average rate of change? Why or why not? So for mean value theorem to apply, uh, mean value theorem again says that A rock equals I rock somewhere on an interval if that interval is differentiable. So we have to figure out if we have a differentiable interval here. From 8 to 20, we have this non-differentiable piece at t equals 16. Uh, so the MVT cannot guarantee anything um, because V is not differentiable on that whole interval. Again, that corner at t equals 16. For number five, we have Karen riding her bike on a straight road from home to school, starting at home at time zero and arriving at school at 12 minutes. Um, during this interval, her velocity is graphed here in this graph here. And that's in miles per minute. And it's a piecewise linear function. Um, so we're guaranteed that all of these different pieces are, in fact, just regular lines. All right, part A. We want to find the acceleration of Karen's bicycle at 7.5 minutes. And you, you give units of measure. Um, so 7.5 minutes, that's right here. Since that is on one of these lines, we just have to find the slope of this line because we know that uh, veloc acceleration is just the derivative of velocity. Um, so if we find the slope of this line, we've got our answer. So we've got, let's see here, this is going to be 0.2 minus 0.3 for the y values and 8 minus 7 for the x or the, the t values. And you actually could leave it like this and put units of measure and be done. If you want to risk it, we can simplify it down. This is going to be negative 0.1 over 1, so negative 0.1. And the units on this is going to be, let's see, the velocity was in units of, they said, miles per minute. So this is going to be miles per minute squared. 
For part C of this problem, shortly after leaving home, Karen realizes she left her calculus homework at home. Oh no, Karen! And she returns to get it. At what time does she turn around to go back home? Give a reason for your answer. The key on this problem is realizing that the velocity graph here, uh, the sign of the velocity, is telling us the direction that Karen is going. When the velocity is positive, like most of this graph here, Karen is heading towards school. When velocity is negative, like down here, Karen is heading back home. Um, so we know that Karen is going backwards on the road back home when that velocity is negative. That means that when velocity changes from positive to negative, like at t equals two minutes, that's the time that Karen must have turned around. So she was heading towards school. She started slowing down, realizing she left her homework at home, turned around at this time, and started going back home, and eventually got there, and then this is when she's heading towards school again. For number six, we have a rocket with a positive velocity after being launched from initial height of zero at time zero. Um, the velocity of this rocket is recorded in the table here at selected values. We want the average acceleration of this rocket over the interval from zero to eight, and then with units of measure. So average acceleration, that's gonna be the average rate of change of velocity. Um, so we're essentially asking for the A rock of this tabular function here. So before we uh, actually plug in specific values, I'm gonna write V of 80 minus V of zero over 80 minus zero. And I'm doing this because I want to show the reader where the values that I'm about to plug in here are coming from. Um, so now that I've done that, I can write in 49 minus 5 over 80 minus 0. And you could stick on units of measure, which is going to be feet per second per second or feet per second squared, and actually be done. Or if you want to risk it, you could simplify this. This would be 44 over 80, um, which would be 11 over 20 if you reduce it. So 11 over 20 feet per second squared, the most reduced answer here. For number seven, we have the graph of velocity in feet per seconds of a car traveling on a straight road from zero to 50, and that's in uh, seconds. So we have a, a table of values at five second intervals, and we have a graph. Um, so different representations here. So now part A wants to know during what intervals of time is the acceleration of the car positive and give a reason for the answer. This is a graph of velocity. Um, acceleration, that's the rate of change of velocity. So whenever acceleration is positive, that means that our car's velocity must be increasing. So one part of our answer is really just writing out that we understand that. We can say A of T is positive or greater than zero when V of T's slope is positive because a of t equals v prime of t. Um, and then we, the other part of the answer is actually figuring out where that happens. Well, we have a positive slope for velocity between zero and all the way over here at 35. This is our turnaround spot. And also we have another one from 45 to 50. Um, so those are our two intervals where we have positive uh, acceleration because our velocity is increasing. For part b, they want average acceleration of the car from zero to 50 seconds. So for this one, we're just asking for the average rate of change in velocity. So we can do V of 50 minus V of zero over 50 minus zero. Um, so we, we're gonna write this out first so that people know where our numbers that we put in are coming from. Um, but now that we've written this, we can write 72 minus zero over 50. And then you could just stick feet per second squared after this and call it a day. It was a calculator question, so if you wanted to, you could divide this and get 1.44 feet per second squared. But as long as you had the units, you didn't actually need to take this extra step. For part C, they want one approximation for the acceleration of the car at time 40 and then show the computations you used. So since we don't know the actual formula for this, um, we can only approximate by taking the average rate of change over an interval. So how about we just find the average rate of change over an interval that includes time 40? Um, probably the best interval to use would be 35 to 45. And if you look up here, um, 40 is you know somewhere on that interval from 35 to 45. So that looks like a pretty good uh, approximation there. So let's do then 
v of 45 minus v of 35 over 45 minus 35. So that's going to be 60 minus 81 over 10. And let's see, that's negative 21 over 10. You could reduce it if you wanted to to negative 2.1 feet per second squared. Um, but honestly, you could have stopped at this point here where you plug the numbers in and just stuck the units on.